Everyone is excited for the wrong reasons about a new muscle therapy. We're in a completely different era of body composition enhancement. You want to burn fat? You want to build muscle? Regeneron Pharmaceuticals has the sword of Athena to the clouds. Holy shit. While the gym rats are dreaming to get yoked, no one's talking about what these two drugs really mean for anti-aging. So I'm gonna take you through the short-sighted assumptions, the deep cellular processes, and into the sci-fi future of medicine. And it's all happening right now. Welcome to Longevity Science News, I'm Emmett Short, and this episode is all about digging beneath the hype surrounding trivagramab and garetosmab to uncover the lead that everyone else has buried. Our sponsor today is just our Patreon page. We have some interviews over there. There is more interviews to come. If you like what we do and you wanna see more of it, definitely think about joining the Patreon or our memberships here on YouTube. They've been tested as a muscle enhancement therapy combo and are being described as the end of steroids. These drugs are currently in phase two human testing. But what's really making headlines is a trial done on primates that basically showed a combination of GLP-1s like Ozempic, Trivagramab, and Garetosmab could burn fat while building muscle without any different training or exercise routine. Theoretically, if you had a twin and you and your twin were both 200 pounds and 20% body fat and your twin went on a natural diet and you went on the same diet, but you took this drug combination, here's Dr. Mike with your results. At the end of that five-month diet, extrapolating from this primate data, you would lose about 28 pounds of fat while gaining nine pounds of muscle. That means while your twin was about 192 pounds at the end of the diet, you would be about 181. And your twin is around 16.5% fat at the end of the diet, you would be around 6.5% body fat. No doubt, this is really cool. Anyone trying to sniff out a link between muscle mass and longevity is bound to come up with the classic ideas. More muscle means more anti-inflammatory signaling, which can slow the chronic inflammation that drives aging from the inside out. More muscle can reduce strain on the cardiovascular system over time, regulating blood pressure and lowering resting heart rate. Same goes for the brain. Exercise-driven muscle activity boosts brain chemicals linked to memory and learning. Muscle provides a protein reserve for healing and supports immune cell production. Plus, stronger muscles mean stronger bones and far lower risk of debilitating fractures. Active muscles support mitochondrial biogenesis. They support better hormonal signaling across insulin, cortisol, and sex hormones. And all of that means a slower slide into the physical decline that we associate with aging. Muscle is good, and these two new drugs promote muscle growth. So obviously, the anti-aging community should be stoked, right? Well, let's slow down. In the studies done with these drugs, trivagramab and garetosmab, time out. Do I have to keep repeating their names? They're kind of a mouthful. I'm just going to call them Trevo and Goretto, or maybe just T and G, or the Mabs. Whatever I call them, I'm going to put this little asterisk at the bottom of the screen. Anyway, the studies done with trivagramab. The early studies measured muscle mass using MRI. So, yes, researchers could tell that muscles looked visually bigger, but Mass doesn't equal strength. Strength depends on how well the muscle fibers are activated and organized. A muscle can look big due to fluid, fat, or untrained tissue. But without dense, well-connected fibers, the muscles won't generate much force. Plus, strength relies on neural connectivity. The brain needs to instantaneously fire the correct neurons to operate the muscle. Usually the brain figures out which neurons to activate over time as the muscle grows. But if the muscle sizes up too quickly, the neural pathways, they need time to catch up. In terms of longevity, that means enhancing the muscle mass of the elderly could easily do more harm than good. I mean, imagine just being weighed down by a ton of muscle that you can't use. <laughs> like you're, you're still decrepit. You look super buff and you still can't get up off the couch. Instead of giving older people more strength to keep them alive, we would probably just make them heavier. Big muscles on brittle bones could cause joints and tendons to buckle. 
and untrained neural connectivity could leave them more unbalanced. It's a counterintuitive idea, but even though muscle keeps people alive longer, giving grandma instant muscles might just kill her. As far as anti-aging goes, timing is going to be crucial when implementing this kind of drug combo as a preventative measure. Enhancing muscle mass around age 40 or 50, along with habits and programs to keep them maintained, could be key. So as far as longevity goes, this kind of muscle enhancement isn't any kind of silver bullet, but it can help. The really exciting breakthrough for anti-aging isn't what these drugs do, it's how they target our biological systems. They're both monoclonal antibodies that target members of the TGF-beta superfamily. Not Human Torch, Invisible Woman, and The Thing, different superfamily. The Transforming Growth Factor Beta superfamily. The TGF-beta family is composed of proteins that regulate the human body's muscle growth inhibition, inflammation and immune response, wound healing, reproduction and hormone signaling, bone development, and basically how cells grow, divide, and behave. The two proteins that we're focused on are myostatin and activin A, which are both associated with muscle growth. The odd thing to understand is that myostatin and activin A are proteins that prevent muscle growth. Why would the human body have multiple functions that naturally stop muscle growth? The simple answer is our ancient DNA wants the body to conserve energy and remain adaptable. Big muscles demand more calories, strain the heart and joints, and reduce flexibility. And those are all problems in survival situations where endurance, efficiency, and quick adaptation mattered more than strength. So evolution favored bodies that could handle scarcity and unpredictability. Even though we now have a long list of modern luxuries and our survival isn't constantly threatened, when we try to short circuit our hardwiring, other bodily systems get out of whack. I, I, I think that is the medical term, out of whack. For example, myostatin limits muscle growth and previous versions of myostatin inhibitors successfully blocked myostatin from blocking muscle growth. But they also enlarged cardiac muscles, which, you know, ruins how the heart functions. Trebdizel targets myostatin, but it specifically limits myostatin in skeletal muscles. Much cleaner, way less deadly. Nice work. Activin A is way more complicated. It engages with way more processes than just muscle growth. And I'll get into that in a second, but this is the protein targeted by Gare Money. So, we know what these drugs target and we know why. The question is how. And my apologies if this is getting more deep and sciencey than you might like, but it's relevant and I'm going to try to keep it simple. Inside your body are cells. On the exterior of those cells are multiple cell receptors. Myostatin, activin A, and other proteins are floating around trying to connect with cell receptors to tell that cell what to do. If you think of the cell like a key ring and the cell receptors like keys, and you think of the signaling proteins as locks trying to connect, these drugs, the MABs, are like shoving silly putty inside the locks so the keys can't connect. So myostatin is going to signal that the cell should stop building muscle. If you don't want that, then TrevTrev can swoop in and prevent the myostatin protein from connecting to the cell receptor. And you might say, yeah, but how? How can a drug possibly pinpoint the exact protein that we don't want to connect to a cell? Well, the answer is likely proprietary, but that's also the point of this video. The ability to sniper off exact proteins on this cellular level to control cell behavior was first successfully attempted with Gary and it targeted activin A. There had been other activin A inhibitors, but they couldn't selectively pinpoint the protein with the precision of G baby MAB. The problem is activin A does more than just inhibit muscle growth. The effects of activin A are context dependent on factors like cell type, developmental stage, and the presence of other signaling molecules or environmental cues. And as a result, activin A can help with tumor suppression, bone formation, or neuroprotection. So it's tough to regulate activin A for muscle growth without potentially interrupting activin A's other duties. So when GMABs successfully blocked activin A, it also caused a cascade of side effects. Let me put it this way. If it was your job to control traffic crossing a bridge and you wanted to prevent all of the blue cars from crossing 
right? You, you could dynamite the bridge and blow it up. And that would work. You would effectively achieve your goal and stop all the blue cars. And it would be a complete disaster because you wouldn't have a bridge and you would have stopped all the other cars as well. That's kind of what happened with Goretta Smab. Active in A was blocked everywhere. And sure, that did help with muscle growth, but patients also suffered headaches, nosebleeds, loss of eyebrows and eyelashes, weirdly, skin infections, soft tissue infections, fatigue, nausea, joint pain. This is not even the full list. I could go on. The success, however, was proof of concept that Activin A could be selectively targeted. We could silly putty one specific type of lock without gunking up all the other lock types. And that's why researchers chose another protein in the TGF beta family, myostatin, when they started working on trivagramab. And it worked. Also, myostatin was uniquely and selectively targeted. And now Regeneron has been raising the stakes even more by testing muscle growth using both T and G simultaneously. They successfully put Silly Putty in the T-lock and they put different Silly Putty in the G-lock at the same time and didn't block any of the other superfamily locks. And the effect of targeting two proteins for the same response, well, it not only ramps up the muscle growth effect, but also reduces side effects because the dosage of both drugs can be lowered. Meaning not only can we target single proteins in the TGF beta superfamily, we can target multiple proteins at the same time with fewer side effects for greater results. And why does that matter to the longevity community? because the TGF beta superfamily controls so many cellular responses, including cell growth, inflammation, and tissue repair, which are topics we talk about all the time on this channel. Plus, plus the TGF beta superfamily can also control the signaling of cell death. That's right, the big reveal gets the big reveal sound effect in the simplest terms. All those little locks floating around your body that connect to keys to tell your cells, hey, you should wipe yourself out with a little apoptosis. We might be able to shove silly putty in all those locks and stop cell death without gumming up any of the other locks. Now, beyond the simplicity of don't die, these drugs offer proof of concept that individual proteins in the TGFB superfamily can be fine-tuned safely and that provides a world of potential. For example, TGF beta signaling ramps up with age and contributes to neuroinflammation, synaptic loss, and reduced plasticity. Targeting just TGF beta one without hitting beta two or beta three could eliminate age-related inflammation in the brain without negatively impacting wound healing or immune regulation. But other big areas of research will be reduced chronic inflammation improved tissue regeneration and repair, potentially delay or reverse functional aging, even if therapies don't directly extend lifespan. They do support a health span focused model of longevity, prolonging the years a person remains active, resilient, and independent. Other proteins in the superfamily can be explored for impacts on skin aging, fibrosis, neurodegeneration, and immune function, which are tightly linked to aging and longevity. Now, while the bodybuilding community might think this is the end game of muscle drug development, the anti-aging community should see that this is the gateway to figuring out tailor-made cellular responses to control health and longevity. This is way more interesting than just bigger muscles. For decades, there have been theories floating around the anti-aging community that the TGF beta superfamily might hold the secret to human longevity. So tip of the hat to those of you who identified this kind of potential long ago. Now you have some solid proof to vindicate your instincts. Are there any specific anti-aging ideas you've come across that might now be viable or any that you're dreaming up thanks to our advancements in protein targeting? Let us know by leaving a comment below. And if you want to get up to speed on GLP-1s to better understand how they fit with the Trev and Gar combo for fat burning, muscle gain, check out our GLP-1 video. And if you know anybody who might be interested in living a bit longer, please share our channel with them. I'm Emma Short. See you next time.